This is part four of emotional behaviors, and I, I need to finish up. So we started attack and escape behaviors, and I didn't quite finish with the escape behaviors. Um, I also am going to do a, a little bit of other emotions, this more larger range of emotions than, than is provided by your book, but I'm going to, but I keep it much shorter than um, I usually do. And then this has a last module of the chapter that's about stress and health. And I think I'm going to skip that this semester. I, I often skip it. Last semester, I did a short sliver of it because of, I think because of the amount of stress I think most of us are experiencing um, with how, with what's going on these days and how, how everything has changed in, um, and the, the extra stress of really having the social isolation. But I think I'm going to suggest that Kelly McGonigal talk at the end. I'm going to include it as part of today's slides, even though that makes me go over quite a bit. And I'll take that, I think it's 10 or 15 minutes, I'll take that time off from the, from the um, slides on Friday. So you can wait to watch that on, on Friday if you want to, but I'm going to leave it with these slides so that we can, I can put emotional behaviors all together and keep it ended today. Some of what we know about what the amygdala does for us comes from work with monkeys where they um, gave them this Kluver-Busey syndrome where they had uh, bilateral damage, to, so damage to both of the amygdalae in the brain. And they really, they became much more tame and placid. They showed no fear. He's showing here uh, um, a monkey who has no fear of a snake after having the, when having the Kluver-Busey syndrome. Uh, they have impaired social behaviors. Part of this is just not knowing when to show some caution as they are um, approaching other monkeys. They show retrograde and anterograde amnesia. So uh, amnesia for things that have happened before the damage and for laying down new memories. They have some visual agnosia, which we talked about in when we talked about perception of just not recognizing what objects are. Uh, they show changes in eating behavior, but to some extent this is talking about hyper orality that they tend to put a lot of things in their mouth to explore uh, to explore things now which if you think about visual agnosia makes some sense that I don't know what this is so I'm going to explore this in a different way and then they show hypersexuality so um, we I'm going to talk about a human who has also has damage to her amygdalae people who have damage to their amygdalae uh, when they are looking at emotional photos, they can classify them just as well as anyone else as being pleasant versus unpleasant. And according to various emotions, I'm going to qualify that in a moment. Uh, they don't have as much any as much emotional um, influence from those photos. They also experience very little arousal from viewing unpleasant pictures, which we just saw. Sort of the more amygdala activity to unpleasant pictures, probably the more anxiety, the, the more tendency for um, uh, battle fatigue and negative emotions that we see. Uh, but these people experience uh, very little arousal from unpleasant pictures. So, but they're able to identify. So those, the cognitive aspect is intact. The emotional response is what is not uh, available. One of the people who is pretty famous for having damage to her amygdalae is SM. Uh, there's been lots of research done on this patient, and as usual, we use just the initials to protect her privacy. But she has um, urbach vithy syndrome, so where the amygdala uh, just wastes away as it just loses its calcium in that in that area, and she tends generally to avoid eye contact. I'm showing some pictures there over to the right where she has drawn uh, various emotions. That's why I said before I'm going to caveat this. They're pretty good at identifying emotions and you can see when she's asked to draw emotions like happy, sad, uh, surprised that she is um, drawing those all right and even has some amount of uh, what's going might, might be going on with the eyes but it's really the overall face. Uh, whereas when they ask her to, um, to draw fear or somebody who is afraid, you can see that she drew this uh, strange sort of 
a cartoon baby kind of facing away, uh, one of the things we see is that when people are afraid, uh, we, we look to their eyes to see that fear and to see what they are afraid of, what they're looking at. And she tends to avoid eye contact, so she's she's lacking a couple of things here, both looking at the eyes and um, the experience of fear, which go together to a large extent. Uh, we, they have several examples of her fearlessness. One thing she does that makes other people uncomfortable is just to step very close to other people, uh, because usually what happens is we get really close to someone when we're talking, there's, amount, there's an amount of nervousness or anxiety, and that's just not there in her. Uh, she has uh, gone down dark alleys and gotten herself into some really scary situations that for her weren't scary. They were very dangerous situations that she just wasn't aware of kind of the danger or that she should be afraid. And this picture is of her actually holding a snake. And so this is not a poisonous snake, but even before going into the um, pet shop, she tells them, oh, I'm definitely afraid of snakes. I've always been afraid of snakes. And this is said uh, very <laughs> deadpan, right? She's telling them she's afraid of snakes, but as they go in, she is happy to pick up a snake. And in fact, they have to stop her from uh, reaching in and touching the poisonous snakes because again, there's just, she's just not thinking through the dangers and how she should be afraid. We also have fMRI studies that suggest that the amygdala is responding to emotional stimuli and facial expressions, but not just to fear or anger, because remember aggression is another aspect of um, the what, what we think of as emotional processing, processing in the amygdala, and why I keep saying it's more than just uh, aggression and fear, or anger and fear that, that the amygdala is responding to. Uh, so this particular study uh, looked at the amygdala response, so the percent signal change in the amygdala to, okay, on the left, on the far left is someone who is angry and their eyes are looking at you. Okay, well that's something that we tend to understand as we've probably had parents, teachers, people who are angry with us, talking to us and they're angry and they are looking at us. And so we have, a, we have some signal change and the amygdala is responding, but not to the same extent as the one next to that, where the person is showing anger and their eyes are averted. So at this point, that facial expression is showing something that's really ambiguous. And the question, we don't see that as often, that somebody is angry, but to something else or somebody else uh, in the room or around. And that's, that's giving us this ambiguity that we need to figure out how to interpret. And that is actually what the amygdala responds more strongly to. I'm gonna move over to the far right. So fear averted uh, is um, what the facial expression is showing. The eyes are averted and the, it, the face is showing fear. And what we see is again, some signal change. The amygdala is responding to fear on a person's face. And we often look right at the eyes, right? To figure out what are they afraid of? Where, where should I look to see what they're afraid of? But notice the one just to the left of that. That is someone showing fear with their eyes directed at us. And that is where we see more response of the amygdala. Because again, this is pretty ambiguous and this is pretty difficult to interpret because it's not very often that we see somebody look at us like they are afraid of us and that's a really ambiguous situation and there again that's where we see the response of the amygdala not necessarily just to anger and fear but to these really ambiguous situations and ambiguous emotions that are difficult to interpret so what that study is showing as well as some of the the previous research looking at people who have damage to their amygdala is that rather than the amygdala being responsible for the feeling of fear and other emotions, that it's more likely that the amygdala is responsible for the detection of emotional information and then directing our attention to, to emotional information that's going to be important for us. One type of anxiety disorder is panic disorder. 
uh, where what happens with these people is they have frequent periods or they have times when they have a really intense kind of anxiety and um, they'll start to have that whole autonomic nervous system response of rapid breathing, increased heart rate, uh, sweating and trembling. And they sometimes read that as that feels like they're having a heart attack, which puts it into this kind of cycle of that causes more anxiety, which uh, creates sort of a longer panic attack. And the panic disorder is having this either frequently or enough times that you, you're gonna call it um, not just a panic attack, but a panic disorder. And this disorder, uh, is linked to abnormalities in the hypothalamus uh, rather than the in the amygdala. So the hypothalamus um, sending off those that the cues of the or the hormones and the fight or flight response. It's also linked to uh, a lower gamma aminobutyric acid or lower GABA levels in those people and higher orexin levels in people who are who tend to have panic disorder. Another anxiety disorder that gets talked about quite a bit uh, these days is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so this involves uh, somebody living through some severe trauma and then having frequent distressing recollections. So these flashbacks to the trauma, nightmares of the event, they tend to try to avoid reminders of the event and they also have um, a vigorous reactions or really uh, some autonomic nervous system reaction to uh, noises and to other stimuli that can be that are triggers for um, remembering the event. Uh, one thing we see and there's we're not really sure what causes some people to have post-traumatic stress disorder in response to a traumatic event and some people to um, not have this kind of uh, this kind of reaction. Uh, what we do see uh, is a is smaller than normal hippocampi in people who have post-traumatic stress disorder um, than people who go through a trauma and do not have this kind of disorder. However, we don't know what direction that goes in, right? This is your regular uh, brain size and experience, behavioral experience kind of correlation where which came first, we don't know, and whether there's a third variable, we don't know. I have your, this is not in your book, but I also have here as the question mark next to serotonin, really maybe low serotonin levels as we see people in people who are um, depressed and people who have low serotonin levels, they also have smaller than normal hippocampi. And what we also see is that uh, they sometimes prescribe a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor for people who have PTSD. Um, so that, that all appears to be somewhat related. Um, but ex again, exactly what's going on with the people who do experience this versus people who don't experience this is not completely clear. A relatively common um, treatment for anxiety disorders is to prescribe anti-anxiety drugs. Um, as much as possible, people move towards any other answer, uh, sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy, because they're very reticent to uh, prescribe these drugs as they are very addictive. Uh, they are a controlled substance because, and they are quite addictive. So the benzodiazepines is this family uh, or class of drugs that include uh, diazepam, which we know as Valium, uh, chlordiazepoxide, which we know as Librium, and al alprazolam, that's what, that one's always hard for me to say, which, is, which we know as Xanax. All of these, what they're doing uh, and what this is showing is they are binding to the GABA-A receptors and facilitating the effects of GABA. So we would call these an indirect agonist as they are facilitating the effects of the, of the neurotransmitter. As I kept saying, I really think that these other emotions are really important and that we tend to stay away from them as they are not easy to look at. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is still staying on a kind of negative note as far as our emotions. And I wanted to say, we have a lot of positive emotions. And I think one of the more powerful things we can learn to do in our life is to, uh, is to learn how to laugh at um, 
a lot of things, especially ourselves, perhaps. But um, so I have this under joy, even though I'm not sure it belongs completely under joy. Uh, but we do have a reward pathway um, where the ventral tegmental area of the brain is producing dopamine, and that goes up through the nucleus accumbens. Um, and again, as I said, this is often still looked at, at a rel from a relatively negative perspective. So Ken Bloom has done quite a bit of research looking at the at a reward deficiency syndrome. So people who are uh, weak in this reward pathway. I think I mentioned this before when very early on talking about brain structures, when I talked about ADHD, of them having low dopamine going through this, uh, what's called this mesolimbic system because it's what's weak in them in people with ADHD is the mesocortical system which is actually going up through the nucleus cumbens and the limbic system and up to the prefrontal cortex and so not only do they have difficulty paying attention from the lower activity of the prefrontal cortex but they also are more likely to become addicted to drugs or have some kind of substance abuse problem. And that's what Ken Bloom is looking at, the reward deficiency syndrome. But the nucleus accumbens and this part of our limbic system is really important for emotion, motivation, and addiction as well. It tags information as something for um, other brain areas to pay attention to. And we will talk about this area again when we're talking about learning and memory, as well as when we talk about psychological disorders. But I didn't want to leave things there because, again, I felt like that stayed on a relatively negative aspect of even uh, joy and happiness and pleasure. We also have love. And love, uh, according to Helen Fisher, we have different kinds of love that we might want to address, like lust, attraction, and attachment. Uh, when we are truly just infatuated with somebody in this kind of lust way, lustful way, we are releasing those hormones, the estrogen and the androgens. When we become more attracted to somebody and maybe, um, maybe more infatuated in a more long-term way where we're having those really intense emotions about somebody, uh, it is associated with elation and craving for emotional union, craving for being with that person. And we see um, release of the monoamines, so all of those, um, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, all of my monoamines. Uh, we also see a release of oxytocin, which we talk about as the bonding hormone, but it is, it is a stress hormone, but it also does influence our uh, bonding. We also see a re release of endorphins, which we've now talked about in um, as relieving pain, but also as an aspect of, of pleasure. And we also see a release of phenylethylamine, which I went and I had not, don't really know much about phenylethylamine, but is, it is sometimes referred to as the love hormone. And when I went to look it up, funny thing, I learned was that you can buy it. <laughs> That's the first few <laughs> links that I got were places to buy phenylethylamine. Don't go buy phenylethylamine. That's silly. <laughs> it's better to just fall in love and have some attraction and release the the love hormone as it's known. Uh, and as we, if we're going to talk about real love, so long-term attachment kind of love and long-term relationships and um, uh, feeling close and intimate and making commitment, that is much more difficult, which again, the reason we look often at things like aggression and or, um, attack and escape behaviors is because we know here we can look in the amygdala, uh, long-term attachment and real love is just much more difficult to examine. My final slide on joy uh, which uh, I don't know how much of this really belongs under joy, but that's where I put it, is laughter. And laughter is another thing that's really difficult to explain. The neurochemistry is hard to explain. So I, I went and found just a few uh, pieces of research to talk about. One was uh, Robert Provine coded 1,200 laugh episodes. And um, he found that social context is important. We laugh when we're nervous, we laugh when we're amused, and we sometimes laugh cynically in response to disappointment. What this, what this means is what's happening in the brain. Again, 
It's hard to explain. We're laughing under different conditions. Researchers caused a 16-year-old girl to laugh by stimulating areas of the left frontal lobe and the supplementary motor cortex, and she would make up stories about why she was laughing. So um, they would make her laugh by stimulating motor areas, and then she would say, well, you just did something funny. So, so the laughing, her laughing itself uh, caused her to create a reason for the laughing, but really it, that was just created by stimulation of motor areas. My last um, example is how laughing can be contagious and to uh, very quickly just introduce this concept of emotional contagion that we do take on other people's emotions. And we talked about mirror neurons and how influential those might be in empathy. But um, uh, looking, seeing people who are sad it, it, and we're watching a movie, can we can feel really sad. Laughing is also contagious and, and watching people smile and laugh can help us to smile and laugh. However, the uh, incident that I found that the first few times I talked about this, I thought this is hilarious and really neat, was an epidemic in, um, I can't say this, Tanganyika, uh, some, somewhere in, in Africa, in 1962. Schoolgirls laughed for six months before the school was shut down to, what was it, to contain the epidemic of laughter. Um, I learned later, so I thought this was funny and it does talk about emotional contagion, but I learned later that this was actually one of those um, not good reasons to laugh. So this was in an area of Africa where um, people were coming in and the school systems were teaching uh, more developed nations, kind of westernized ideas of what um, children needed to learn. It really went against what they were learning in their home lives. And some of these small towns that were feeding into these schools, uh, schoolgirls would start laughing. And then, but it was more like a, uh, that kind of nervous laughter or that laughter when you're really uncomfortable and something's really wrong. And that then um, started this sort of contagion of laughter uh, in the school and it traveled into some of those smaller towns where whenever the girls started would see each other, one would start laughing and another would start laughing and they, they would just start laughing, but it was not a, a happy laughter. So while well, again, I wanted to, I wanted to find uh, information about uh, brain chemistry and brain regions that were involved in some more positive emotions. I did not do the best job, but I think it really is because the science is, um, not strong in that area because it's just it's very hard to explain we're seeing it all over the brain it's there's nowhere we, we can point to hey this is where happiness lives okay that's my end of emotions i know i went long and i'm going to start learning in memory today so i have skipped a little tiny bit in the um emotional behaviors chapter and I am skipping this sliver about stress and health. I think it's really good for you to go look through uh, the effects that stress can have on our immune system and um, that relationship between stress and health. But uh, we are getting pretty behind. I wanna stay on time. And I think a pretty powerful thing for us to be able to do is to think about stress in a bit more positive light and to see how how we can change the way we think about our stress and how we can respond to our stress differently in this um, kind of way to make stress our friend as that is this Kelly McGonigal talk and so right now I'm almost right at 50 minutes this um, TED talk is 14 15 minutes and I'm gonna leave it here in this section with the emotional behaviors so I'm gonna leave it here on Wednesday, but I'm gonna take this time off from, from the Friday time because we're gonna go over for 14, 15 minutes today. You can take that off or you can save it to watch on Friday if you're doing this in this these 50 minute slices. But I, I kind of, I wanna put this here because, uh, it, because this is where it makes sense to put it. Okay, 